Sal, you've talked a lot about mastery learning, which is basically allowing students to learn at the right pace. What exactly do you define it as and how are you applying it to Khan Academy? Yeah, mastery learning in some ways is the most common sense way to learn and it's not my idea, it goes way back, it's arguably the first way of learning, which is if you're learning a musical instrument and you're working on a more basic piece and you've got it 80% well, instead of moving on to the more advanced one, take the time necessary to learn the more basic one, then the advanced one will make more sense. Same thing in a math class. Over the last 200 years or so, we've had a, an education system that for frankly logistic reasons have had to not allow students to master things and move at their own pace, but instead move them all lockstep. And then what happens is we're in a seventh grade class, we're learning exponents, and I get an 80% on the exam, even though I have that 20% gap, we then have to move on to a more advanced topic. And what typically happens is that kids eventually hit a wall when they get to an algebra class or a calculus class or a physics class. And in mastery learning, you, you just, instead of holding fixed how long and when you do something with a variable outcome, you make variable when you can work on something and you say, hey, everyone should really master that concept and not have these gaps. And a few years ago, you went brick and mortar with the Khan Lab School. Two of your kids actually go there. I mean, what have you learned through that experience? Have you changed the model at all? Well, it's called a lab school on purpose so that because we're constantly changing the model. But the core underlying idea is around mastery learning, that if we let students use tools like Khan Academy to learn at their own time and pace, that at the end of the day, they're going to learn faster and they're going to learn more. And it takes a little bit of a leap of faith. Uh, every teacher we talk to, say a seventh grade teacher, they know that there's some students in that class who are operating at a fourth grade level and there's some students in the class operating a ninth grade level and they wish they could cater to their individual needs but they're like well if I let that one at the fourth grade level work on fourth grade work will they ever get to seventh grade uh, but what we're seeing is if you take that leap of faith you let them work on what is appropriate for them then when they get to the seventh grade work it happens much faster and are there major challenges with having students of all different ages in the same classroom there are some challenges when you think about you know who's mature for what book or whatever else but there's a lot of benefits too where students can mentor each other they can take care of each other you know my my daughter uh, when she was six she's seven now you know when she scraped her knee a couple of months ago the the first responder was a 12 year old and I think there's just something very powerful about that and it's something very natural it's the way we you know human history was like that. And you have 15 million learners a month in 190 countries. That's pretty impressive. You could probably easily monetize that. So why stay a nonprofit and keep it free? Yeah, you know, when, when Khan Academy started, it was it was a little bit delusional. I was operating out of a walk-in closet. It's much bigger. We, you know, we have 200 full-time employees now. But I, I, it, was, it was this idea of, like, well, maybe the Khan Academy could be a, an institution for the next generation of learners or many generations of learners. And I thought, well, a, a home run and a for-profit, that would be nice. But a home run as a not-for-profit, maybe it could be the next Smithsonian, the next a library system. And now it's not so delusional. We really do envision it, you know, well beyond my life and uh, general generations to come that billions of people will hopefully be able to learn on Khan Academy uh, from pre-K all the way through the core of college, get jobs, uh, get credentials that will be recognized anywhere in the world. And so uh, it feels like the only way to stay focused on a vision like that is to stay nonprofit. And you've got dozens of impressive luminaries to buy into Khan Academy. You have Bill Gates, Eric Schmidt as advisors. How exactly have they impacted the organization? You know, I, I think their, their biggest impact has been one as advisors to, to help us think big. How do we really scale this to a global scale and reach the billions that we want to? Um, and really, they, they've also been really valuable amplifiers. You know, Bill Gates famously 10 years ago when, when he really got involved at Khan Academy was, was telling everyone, well, I use it, I use it, my children use it. And that was a big signal to a lot of folks because a lot of folks, when they see something nonprofit or free, they're like, okay, well, that might be good for the folks who can't afford something. I'll go off and pay these tutors or whatever else. But, but when Bill Gates said, no, no, I use it, that was a big signal to folks that no free doesn't mean not world-class and that's why our mission statement is a free world-class education because we want it and it is uh, arguably the most effective way to learn and what do you make of these tech billionaires investing in education I mean we recently have just Jeff Bezos coming out and saying he's investing in uh, early education I mean what do you make of that I think it's very positive I think you know from from the outside it can sometimes feel like oh or you know is, is there is there something deeper going on but uh, everyone that I've interfaced with many of whom have been donors to us it's 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 a very positive intent uh, they see what's happening kind of at a max Macro level that you know the pyramid of, of our society where you know you need a lot of labor and then you have a, a kind of a middle class it's kind of an information processing class and then you have the top which is the creative class that that's changing robotics AI are they're collapsing those bottom two layers so we need to invest in education so more people can participate at the top 